But when I set up Tamarin 23 years ago, I, I was publishing. I had to go to the bank manager to get money to run the publishing company. And we are talking about the cultural issues here. Mm -hmm. I wrote to the bank. I sat outside his office. He had a letter from Vernon Wilkins, publisher, requesting £25,000. And he came out, and I was the only person sitting outside his office. <laughs> And he knew he had an appointment to see a publisher. <laughs> so it's says total invisibility. So he came in, came out, he looked up and down, and he went back in. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I could just feel the adrenaline going. And then he came out again. And he said, I stood up, and I said, excuse me, and he looked at his watch. He had a meeting with a publisher. <laughs> and he didn't say so, but I, I got it right away. Yeah. But I still needed that money, didn't I? Yeah. So I said, excuse me, uh, are you Joe Bloggs and Vernon Wilkins? And he went absolutely puce. <laughs> and I thought, well, he's going to have a heart attack, and I'm not going to get this money. <laughs> So I so said, well, will you come into my office? And I said, no. How do I bridge this gap between credibility and invisibility? When, you're, when I, I, I say to young writers, and I work with young writers, I mean, the prison system, um, um, people that are on death row, and if you want to see beauty writing, and I say to them, when you write, you write for yourself, first of all. Don't even think about writing for the market. Because the moment you start doing that, then the commercialism comes in. You have to dilute your message. And when we are not listening to what people are saying, let me tell you, the riot will occur again. And what I will say to every single publisher, OK, you don't want to write, um, sell our story. That's fine. In America, like my dad was involved in civil rights movements and everything, they started their own businesses, they started their own publishing house, they started it, yeah, they got so angry, they started their own business. They weren't writing and saying, please take our work, that's begging, that's to me, it's begging, please take our work, oh, oh, I wonder why I'm not getting so, I've got young people, they say, we don't care, they, they, they're not going to sell our work, Angela, you know what I mean? life here so we don't care. So I said to them, just set, start up your own in-house publishing business. And it's really interesting to hear a lot of things about the industry, but of course he was talking about kind of like, what is the crux of the problem? And for me, it's not about the industry, it's actually a cultural thing. White writing in English is a white art form. And they never see that we can actually live up to their kind of be as good as them. So when you talk about quality, we can never match their quality, we can never emulate, we can only ever imitate, we can only ever ape what they're doing. And so they will always kind of downgrade us because, ah, oh, you don't write like Shakespeare. That white guy, he could sure write. You know, and, and you know, I've written, and, and in terms of that pigeonholing, um, I wrote a, a, a short play about indentured labour, um, and that is a very British story, but nobody can identify with the Britishness of indenture and, and the slavery of it and the colonial, colonialism of it because pff, it's not happening in the South Hall, it's not, you know, it's not a now age story. The only way they can relate to us is what's happening now because that's all they understand of our history. They think we washed up on the shores, um, you know, just because we want to get into this country. They don't realise about colonialism, how it works. We are here as a consequence of you being there and affecting our lives. And we are, we, whenever